value our input into the collaboration, initiate connections. So we need to know where our visions align. We need to know that, okay, yes, we can build on this vision because it's a shared responsibility and um, because it's a collective goal that we both have. So we need to um, then begin to buttress and, uh, and scale up that connection rather than talking more about our differences. So even the company's corporate philosophy, you need to look at things like that. Our uh, culture's too different for us to come together and collaborate. Those are things that are always going to be key, but we need to be able to focus on that connection that is initiated. And um, remember your mission. Again, why are you doing this? What is that goal? What is that mission? What is that vision that you are trying to reach as an organization? And will this company help you reach there faster? Um, if you're able to keep these things in mind, it's always very, um, it, makes it, it makes the journey easier. And of course, provide feedback anywhere that you're not happy with how the conversation is going, by all means, bring it up, let it get discussed. Um, then ensure goals are clear. Like you said, those are the key things. The goals need to be clear um, before you know that you're on the right, on the right path. Point, um, the factors to lose when entering into a collaboration, we talked about some of them, but I'll go through them quickly. Figure out why you want to collaborate. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, with collaborations, you typically enter an NDA, which will probably give you an exclusive period um, to assess this business. So three months, six months, whatever we're saying. Within these six months, I'm not going to be speaking to anybody else about this collaboration. But if we're not able to consummate it at that six month period, then I'm allowed to go and speak to somebody else. But so when we say do not put all your eggs in, in one basket, we're not saying at the same time, we're not saying that you should breach the terms of your contract, but we're saying that be open to options. So when you're looking for collaborating part partners in the first place, do not look for only one. You need to find at least two or three and begin to assess why one is better than the other so that, of course, you have a hierarchy by which um, you're assessing each of those companies. And um, work with doers. Um, when you're working with someone who's just discussing white elephants, it means you're probably not going to go anywhere. Um, so the, the, the more realistic a potential collaboration partner is, um, in discussing their goals and their, their, their expectations, um, the better it is for, for you as a firm. Make sure you are a priority. So in, in every collaboration exercise, there are two parties, and both parties need to feel like they are a priority one to another, just so that they can ensure that you know, this, this doesn't drag on for too long. Look at the size of the project. There are some projects that, um, given where you are, you can make a logical decision decision as to whether or not you want to go into it. And um, because during the collaboration, your business does not stop operating, right? Your business still operates. So meaning that you still need some of your resources to be focusing on your clients. Um, so if, if it's a collaboration that is going to take 40 hours a week for all the team members to be able to achieve it, then perhaps it's not for you at that point in time. Perhaps you also need to reach a certain level of growth before you can consider um, such, such, such um, a collaboration. So some things might, might take too much from you, but they're often little or no ROI. So you need to be able to make those decisions and make that call. Um, check out their core values. Like we said, you have to align. There has to be a point at which those um, businesses align in their values, in their vision, in where it is they're trying to go. And if that's not the case, then of course, that's not the right collaboration for you. Um, identifying collaboration opportunities. Um, I'm going to run through these very quickly because I want us to have some time to look at the look at some of the case studies, and we only have I think 45 minutes. Um, so collaboration, like we said, can be long term, one specific um, specific project. It can be one off. Um, so here are some of the pointers: a common goal, shared values, complementary skills, similar business culture. Because you're going to work together, so you can't have you can't be working with someone where your cultures are completely different. Um, the right tools and mutual trust. Um, how do you identify these opportunities within the market? Of course, um, you, I mean, you can explore indirect opportunities by simply looking at organizations that complement your business or looking at organ organizations that are offering a completely different product. Um, you can use focus groups to get a sense of, you know, what is out there, um, what do we need to know, understand the market. The market so whether it's your market, whether it's the collaborating partners market, whether it's your competitor's market, understand the market that you're trying to get into. Um, talk to current customers again through focus groups. Um, review environmental factors. What are the regulations that are going to come up? Are there regulations that are going to come up next year that's going to affect this collaboration? We need to consider that. Um, how long is this collaboration going to take? Is it something that um, you know, before you're done, 
the, the naira has devalued and it, it's something that requires raw material importation you need to consider all of those factors before you get into um, get into those kinds of collaboration systems carry out competitors and complementors analysis um which complementors my best example in the nigerian context is always coke and gala um for example you know so if coke is signing a contract with uh, i don't know um, nigerian football association that they will have a stand at every game you as the gala or the pastry provider can also get into that agreement and collaborate with coke and say look wherever you go when you have games we'll be there with you right so that that's a compl complemented um type of collaboration strategy um, analyze foreign markets, investigate other, other industries. Um, you may find that your your rather than collaborating with someone in your sector, you want to co collaborate with someone in another sector so that um, you can control the value chain. Um, there, there, there are several reasons, and a lot of these things um, obviously need to be considered. How do you tap into those opportunities? You focus on an effective number, um, so you don't pursue too many pursue too many at the same time. You have to be able to focus. Um, continually trace solutions back to the customer's need. So it's not enough to say, I want to do this. Does your customer need that service? Um, there's no point establishing a whole system um, for a service that no one wants or no one needs. Um, do not jump to the solution too quickly. Test it. Test its acceptance in the market. Think short-term and think long-term. So with every collaborating, um, collaborative endeavor, try to understand, okay, what benefits can we get um, in the immediate term and what benefits can we look forward to um, in the long run. I've already explained these, um, so I won't go into the four of them um, again. Um, so the collaboration framework, um, what, what is it really? Um, it's grounded, um, the, the pretty much four, four common elements, grounding your core foundation, processes and contextual factors, as well as your outcomes. These are things that we really need to focus on. Um, and then the collaborative um, framework elements are grounded, uh, must be grounded in valuing, uh, must be grounded in respecting diversity, must be grounded in honoring uniqueness, um, honoring talents of individuals or groups of, of people. So you need to, th these are like the basis, the basics upon which you will build, can we build a collaboration? What are those things? How do you value your people? How does the potential collaborating partner value their people? or just generally value their environment, value their community, value the space within which they work. So we need to understand some of these things. And they provide the opportunity to recognize unique skills and capabilities. And for the core foundation, the common ground is understanding. Um, you know, the discipline of building a core is concentrated around a never ending process. So what is that on common ground of understanding that we both have? Um, how can we create a sense of common purpose? And this becomes the foundation upon which that collaboration gets um, built. So you need to understand the philosophies of both organizations. The outcome, what do we want? What's the desired condition for the community or the firm or for individuals within those firms? The mirror success in working to reach the collaboration's results or to outturn. So we need to understand what is our outcome, how our outcomes are aligned. Does it work for both parties? Um, contextual and process factors. The process factors are always based on the how to. How do we do this? Um, when we get into this, when we get into this system, how do we get to a place of success um, in this? Um, what skills do we require? What components are essential to making sure that we reach um, we reach the, this place? Contextual factors are specific, but of course they are also constantly changing. Um, so if you, if you build something on today's context, you need to know that you, you must adjust it to tomorrow's context when that comes. But so it, it must be limited in that context with which um, it has been developed in the first place. And those are some of the things that we need to be clear about. So the common elements of portions that can boost or inhibit collaborations and ultimately impact um, the outcome. For the agreement, what, what are we saying? How will the parties work together? So this is part of the governance and the regulatory part. Um, how the collaboration benefits will be shared? What are the obligations and the responsibilities um, of each party? And of course, what's the collaboration goal between these parties and the termination and dispute re resolution clauses? Nobody goes into anything to fight, but the truth is with people, there would always be conflict. So we must be able to address potential conflicts that may arise um, while discussing collaborations and these are the key things that should be included in that agreement. The details, of course, of the project, um, schedule and the period of the collaboration, the exclusivity, of the, the exclusive usage, confidentiality, 
unauthorized use of information that becomes available to you as a result of the collaboration exercise, reporting and project management, um, payment agreement. So each party is going to have a cost, um, a cost element. How do they pay? When do they pay? What do they pay? Um, Non-solicitation, um, dispute resolution, reporting. Um, so just an understanding of what should go into those, um, those agreements are very key. Um, so we will spend a few minutes, um, a few minutes just looking at some examples of Nigerian brands um, that have collaborated, um, some of those, some of the things that we think are their successes. Um, here we have the example of Oando Marketing Limited and Big Treat. Um, with all retail oil and gas um, stations, um, I mean, typically we know with their quick service restaurants, their QSRs that they build behind. Um, with a lot of them, they're different. But these days, we have a lot of brands, a lot of retail downstream companies choosing to collaborate with specific um, QSRs, so quick service um, restaurants, um, food and beverage. So they are collaborating with specific people. So everywhere, for instance, they were an Oando, or with this collaboration, where an Oando um, retail station opens up, you will have big treats, you will have their restaurant at the back. Um, you can also have maybe a cake making guy, you can have a laundry, you can have, but that, that is the collaboration that allows um, a company, a, a beverage company or a QSR company to have access to a lot of markets, especially when you collaborate with a big downstream, retail downstream company, because they will get you where you need to go faster than you need to go there. You're not responsible for building um, their, their, their back end. They are the ones who will build it. So all you need to do is move in. And because you already have a collaborative agreement, they will probably even build it to suit what you need. Um, so obviously that, that, that was a win-win situation. Orlando must provide that because of course it's a revenue generator for it. But you who partners with Orlando to perhaps follow them everywhere they go, you also have access to market because of course they have their own strategy. You also have access to markets that you may not necessarily have been able to enter. And um, with Flutterwave and Uber, we are all familiar with Uber, we are familiar with Flutterwave. Um, so for that payment system, they, they, they wanted to launch the Uber Cash. Um, so it's a digital watch, wallet feature in Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't think it's in Nigeria yet. I, I, I don't use Uber much these days. But the new feature will allow Uber riders to top up their Uber wallet. So rather than for those of you who are not comfortable with putting your card, or rather than having to stop at an ATM machine to get um, to get cash, you can just top up your, your digital wallet on your Uber app, and then you get paid. That obviously is ease for customers, and both parties benefit from it in, in terms of revenue and in terms of usage. Standard Bank Group, Bank Group and Flutterwave, it's very similar to the Flutterwave and Uber because it gives um, Standard Bank um, customers um, access to more digital payments using Flutterwave. So Flutterwave also increases their customer base, giving um, the customer base that the standard bank group has. So there, there's definitely several benefits, even just on the, on the front view without going deeper. Etisalat and Samsung, those are complementing companies. I offer the software, you are the, I offer the, the, the digital platform, you offer the device. Um, it's a no brainer. Um, I mean, another collaboration that can even make this more fantastic is maybe with 9SB Bank, so that, you know, you don't have money to buy the Samsung phone now, but you can pay in installments. So those, those are complementing services that make complete sense. You don't even need to think um, about them in terms of the value that they will add, because they're, they're, they're very obvious. Um, <clears throat> A few others, Ericsson and MTN Nigeria, which is similar to the Nine Mobile and Samsung in terms of the value add, the value add. MTN Nigeria and Intelligra, this is the one I talked about in terms of buy now, pay later. So you can, you can even extend, for example, this, this arrangement, and, and I'm sure that's what they do. So Intelligra is willing to pay for the phone. MTN already has an, a collaboration agreement with Ericsson. So they bring the Ericsson phones, you pay, and, and all of that. Ericsson, there's also the 5G system that they are working with MTN. Um, okay, so that's what this one is. So for instance, the Samsung and 9 Mobile. So all MTN Nigeria, for example, needs to do here is also partner with a phone company. They can partner with Apple. They can collaborate with, you know, with whatever phone company they want, techno or, or, you know, or the likes, to be able to get this financing done. And it immediately increases your customer base because more people can now afford to buy those phones. 
um, Max and um, DFD, Microfinance Bank. Um, so they also entered into a partnership for the purpose of financial inclusion. Again, this is the, I'm able to give you credit. I'm able to open lines of credit um, for my Max drivers to finance their vehicles. So all I'm providing is, a, is a, an Okada hailing service, right? Um, but of course, you can't afford the Okada. So I'm giving you the person who can finance that Okada so that you can get on my platform. So th these are definitely complementing um, activities um, that, that you know, give people, people access and give businesses access to larger markets. You know, seeing motors and Plenty Worker. Plenty Worker is a bus hailing service. It's a bus hail, hail, um, hailing app. Okay, so they also, um, in their own case, they, they, they want to own their own assets. But they need to partner with Innocent Motors to be able to provide um, to be able to provide these buses and expand and expand their reach. Again, that is a you know of course with security challenges, people are now more comfortable or I will now prefer to be in a bus selling bus, you know, a bus that belongs to a platform rather than a bus generally on the street. Um, so these these are all these are examples of no brainers that you know people can definitely. Um, definitely take um, time out um, to look at um, in detail. Maybe what will happen is I will look at just one, Gerald Care versus, uh, because I have one minute left, or rather my one minute just um, expired. So let's just look at Gerald Care versus Advantage Healthcare Africa. So these are the case studies in detail now. Um, what did Gerald Care seek? Um, Gerald Care uh, was seeking healthcare investors who would help them fill their needs of sourcing and delivery of prescribed medicines um, to their patients at home. So Gerald Care is a geriatric, um, is a geriatric company that had elderly people on their platform. They would send doctors um, to the houses of elderly, elderly people to take care of them when they were sick. But what they would then do is they would prescribe drugs because they are not pharmacists, because they didn't have pharmacists on their platform, because that was not their business uh, model. So they would prescribe drugs and these people would still have to go. Sometimes their patients would call them, well, we can't find this drug, where do we get it and all of that. So they, they, they had a challenge with that. And their problem was that they needed to be able to partner or they needed to be able to get to a point where they could prescribe medicines to their patients and deliver to their patients at home. Advantage Health Africa, on the other hand, was seeking healthcare investors who will help them feel their needs of having more access to patients to whom they can provide their pharmaceutical services. So on the other hand, Advantage Healthcare Health Africa was a, was a pharmaceutical, was a tech-enabled pharmaceutical company where you would call and you would order certain medicines or you would tell them what you would, you would share your, um, your diagnosis with them. They would prescribe drugs and they would deliver it to you. So they, they, they were struggling with a customer base of quote and unquote sick people while Gerald Care was struggling um, with meeting the needs, um, the medical, the, the pharmaceutical needs of the clients that they already had, which were either you know, elderly people or, or sick people already, which was the market that Advantage Health Africa required. Um, so about, health, about both companies, I've already discussed that. What was the objective of the collaboration? Um, they had a lot of qualified doctors, but no one to prescribe medicine, because as we know, doctors don't prescribe drugs, pharmacists do. So they had a lot of qualified doctors, but no pharmacists. They entered into collaboration with Advantage Health Africa to be able to prescribe these medicines. Um, Advantage Health Africa, on the other end, has medicines, has drugs, has pharmacists, but they needed um, patients. So they entered into the collaboration with Gerocare to get access to their own customers and their own towns and villages because Gerocare was present in all 35 states in Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> what was the impact of, of, of this collaboration? Um, Gerocare, under the, under the My Medicine subsidiary, um, was able to get Advantage Health Africa to deliver drugs to the patient across the, the state and the FCT. Um, directly from pharmacists and at the most affordable prices. So they were able to provide a holistic service to their already existing client base um, at the best prices they could get, while Advantage Healthcare um, was able to have access to all the, the client, the, the, the patients that Gerald Care had, again, across Nigeria. Prior to this, I think Advantage Healthcare was only a um, residents in about two or three states across Nigeria. So for them, that was definitely a big, um, a big deal. What was the outcome of this? Jeroke had access to pharmaceutical services they need to provide 
um, a holistic service to their patients. Advantage Healthcare, Health Africa now has access to more patients across all states and FCC in Nigeria. So both businesses were immediately enabled um, to increase their revenue and their, you know, their, their delivery to their staff, um, to their different client bases. Mr. Killian, I don't know, I can stop now, or Chichi Chichi is here. Um, I just took an extra four minutes to at least be able to discuss this one case study. Um, but if we have time in the Q&As, maybe we can come back to it because I think we have about four or five. But so that I don't run into our time, we can actually stop now if that's okay. Yeah, I think we should stop by 12 o'clock. This is 11.59. So we'll okay, take it. <laughs> one, one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just conclude. Thank you. Okay, so I, I was done. I was done with that. Um, Kuda, Kuda versus Vita. Um, Kuda, I mean, Kuda is an online bank. Um, Vita is a card provider. We don't even need to really discuss this in detail in terms of the numbers and in terms of the access. Vita obviously has a larger market base. Um, Vita is always looking for banks to partner with to be able to deliver, um, to be able to deliver digital products, um, card pay, um, card payment solutions as well as cards. So CUDA and Visa, I mean, it makes sense immediately that they will collaborate to both give each other access to a large, larger market at, you know, at a reasonable, um, at a reasonable rate. So I would stop now and then Chichi, please, um, you can go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, um, Tina. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, really thank you, Tina, for giving us this uh, background um, and being able to deal with some of the fears. So a lot of people have fears. And thank you for letting us know that some of these fears can be mitigated, you know, because we need to grow. The first thing is to identify what is the objective of the collaboration we, 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 have, we want. And, and from there, some of the fears, you know, there are always solutions to it. So the need for documentation, proper documentation cannot be overemphasized because if you want to collaborate with people, they need to see what you have done and what you are doing. So um, over the years, looking at files, um, of different companies that want to go into collaboration, most of the issues you, you find is around the documentation. So it cannot be overemphasized the importance of documents. As a business owner, you need to keep your document, the document of all your transactions, so that when it gets to this point that you need collaboration, it will be easier to continue. Thank you so much, Tina, for this session. And uh, we'll be moving to the panel session immediately. Um, like Mr. Killian has introduced initially, we have three. Oh, sorry. So just a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, the first person we have, um, Akimbo Akin Olubade. He's a co-founder and the managing partner, and sorry, and the managing director of Kawai Technologies. He has successfully led the supply chain management company to become one of the West African largest, dealing with an array of blue chip Nigerian firms and international players operating both at home and abroad. Um, so we have um, Akimbo joining us this morning. Uh, this afternoon is 12 already. And we also have Izu Uwama, Zu Wama is the founder and CEO of Hexabia Group. He has a decade of experience, over a decade of experience working with startups and business and, and big businesses. You know, he started up the Hexabia Group and then he has been able to organize the company, offer professional services in enterprise and corporate planning, branding and business strategy and human capital development. He has a proficient skill in enterprise development he has, he has a prolific R and an authority in the brand of human capital and business training, as well as project consultants. Consultant. So he'll be able to give us his own perspective on this topic we are dealing with during the panel section. And our third panelist is Arosa Osewige. He's the managing partner of Adium Consulting, a human resource consultant, excuse me, <coughs> A human resource consultant, service excellence activist, a workplace readiness coach, a life and career coach, a job search strategist, and a youth investigator, a writer, and a corporate trainer. So um, our panelists this morning, um, this afternoon, will be taking up 
will be answering some of the questions from their own wealth of experience. You know, these are people that have worked over the period and have done some form of collaboration, and they are going to be telling us from their experience so that we'll be able to take home in real life experiences of what people have gone through and how they have been able to achieve as successfully, successfully um, how the collaboration has successfully impacted their business. So we'll start with Arosa. Please, can you? Okay, he's on already. All right, thank you. So, um, Arosa, please, we want you to tell us your own personal experience um, and also or from, your, from your client experience what business collaboration you have gone into and the impact of such um, collaboration in your business or that of your clients. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, it's a pleasure yes. to be in our midst. Uh, today, uh, thanks for that uh, background, a very detailed background by Tina. Uh, this is, it is apt to say that uh, uh, you have said it all, <laughs> you know, just a, a few points I could add, uh, maybe just, uh, you know, just additional points. You know, as I thought about this and gathered my thoughts, I, I kept thinking that collaboration is uh, what you may call a cost-effective, uh, resource light way of extending one's business into, you know, new markets, other industries, new customers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It provides, you know, a means for accessing skills and services without employing people. You know, it's uh, it can be a means for generating confidence, brand recognition much faster than the organic or the high spend advert driven method. It's a, what you could call a low cost hands-on training scheme, because guess what? You learn from others, uh, from what others know, you learn from their mistakes and their methods. Uh, you could, we will definitely all agree. I mean, listening to Tina, that it's a low hanging method for getting uh, business clients and growing revenue. But we all haven't leveraged collaboration enough. We all haven't leveraged collaboration enough, definitely. Uh, if we didn't think so, just following the presentation, you could see that in one way or the other, we're all leaving some money on the table uh, because we haven't leveraged collaboration enough. Or uh, better yet, uh, we, I could say that uh, we haven't developed business collaboration, you know, as a known and as a common business competence for entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, and, so, and the likes. And I also think neither have we, you know, built enough strong supporting platforms to engineer it, engineer a lot of uh, organic or just natural collaborations there. But Specifically, looking at uh, uh, my experience and looking at, uh, you know, just from my own dashboard, I, I would like to focus a little more on the, you know, maybe from the entrepreneur, uh, uh, the growing business or the mid-sized business uh, uh, angle. So you, you have, I've seen options or uh, types of collaborations running from uh, say, uh, the very temporary ones to permanent ones and running from things as simple as uh, uh, sharing resources, collaborating on resources like office sharing, for example. Uh, I've seen joint bids for jobs, um, projects, just as a way of extending your value proposition or even serving as like a specialist subcontractor you know, as a way of uh, uh, being able to provide service to maybe to a, uh, a more established organization or business, or even also extending your offering uh, through the use of uh, uh, specialist subcontractors in areas say you, uh, you don't have the expertise, you don't have the right tools, or which could be better served by another person. And a lot of what I would also call loose partnerships, which would just be people who 
uh, you have uh, uh, maybe written and sometimes all written agreement that in certain areas, you will be my go-to person. Uh, in certain other areas, I will be your uh, go-to person. Uh, maybe later on, I, I could share some thoughts on maybe how you should go about uh, choosing one. Uh, and I will say that Tina has really, um, you know, honed in on that. But maybe at, at another point, one can look at, at it. I do feel that a challenge we have had, and I will make this point and pause. I do feel a challenge that we've had uh, generally has been uh, these, uh, the views that some have espoused about partnership because collaboration is, is partnership, whether it's from the uh, light um, versions, loose versions to the more permanent ones. I do feel that uh, part of the challenge we've had is some of the uh, what some people have said about oh because there are people <laughs> who believe those things you know uh, to the T that oh partnerships are bad and so on or admittedly some people have uh, have gone into uh, the less productive ones at one point or the other uh, but uh, as we continue to what I would like to call unknow our world or our former world and take advantage of the unfolding world, we, we all need to grow uh, the competence for uh, extending our business, growing faster. And that, that's what Tina said to us, growing faster by collaborating. And there are a lot of options. And that's the whole idea we, we, are, we are trying to espouse today and help us all to build the competencies in our businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we go to Mr. Akimbo. Um, in five minutes, please, we would like you to share with us your the strategies you have used over the period um, in your business, in terms of business collaboration. What are the strategies you have employed um, so far, some of your experiences. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so for me, I, I look at, at business collaboration a bit differently. And um, like you pointed out, I, I have had some interesting experiences. Um, I'll say, for me, uh, my main business, which is Kawai, um, there are four like areas of collaboration that I'll just touch on briefly. Um, one of the popular ones being joint ventures, where everyone retains their own distinct identity and they go into um, a common business together with common objectives and a, a clearly laid out um, breakdown of of what the you know proceeds, profit shares, cost shares uh, are going to be. And I'll give an example. Uh, of something we did about three or four years ago. Um, we we're trying to diversify, um, or let me back up first. Uh, our business is mainly supply chain management. Um, we tend to deal with infrastructure companies and, and um, mostly um, and we deal with manufacturers of different materials uh, uh, um, that they require on their sites uh, all across the country. So um, that's everything from uh, aluminum to glass, to chipboard, to, you know, uh, whatever. So anyway, so back to my point. So we found we were very sector specific and, um, you know, of course, concentration risk uh, in a sector. So we wanted to diversify a little bit and we decided on um, uh, looking at agro uh, exports, um, especially because uh, export proceeds, because we we import a lot. We wanted something to offset our exchange rate fluctuations. And we have no experience in agriculture. Um, and so we, we did a joint venture with a company that they uh, were doing this and it was cash flow. And um, while in theory, this sounds nice, it, it ended up being a very bad experience. Um, and not because of the collaboration style. I, I think the collaboration style itself was good in that everyone maintained their independent identities and uh, they brought experience in the agro um, sector and then we brought in financing and our logistics um, expertise. 
However, the mistake we made on, on our part um, in hindsight was that we assumed that they were just as competent in that agro um, space as we are in our space.